Now I'm curious, how many of you have heard about Bitcoin before today? Wow. All right, put your hands down. How many of you have Bitcoins? All right, very nice. A couple of years ago, there probably would have been only a couple of you. So this, this is really cool. I'm excited to get to talk to you about Bitcoin today. Now, when I first heard about Bitcoin, I didn't quite get it. But I was curious, so I tried to learn more. And the more I read, and the more I spoke about it, and spoke to people about it, the more excited I became about the potential of what it could enable people to do. And that's why, about a year ago, I decided to give up on everything that I was doing and start working full-time on several Bitcoin projects. I was really excited to do this, but those around me were a little bit less enthusiastic. My parents were worried that I was getting sucked into a Ponzi scheme. My friends, they warned me not to take this magic internet money too seriously. And I can understand these concerns. I mean, there are a lot of misconceptions about Bitcoin. So just to clear a couple of things up right at the beginning, Bitcoin is not a company or an organization. It doesn't have a CEO and doesn't have any employees. It cannot go bankrupt. It's simply an open source software that allows people to transfer money over the internet. If you want to get some Bitcoins, all you need to do is accept it as a method of payment for goods or services, or you can always go buy some on a Bitcoin exchange, which works kind of like the stock market. Now, Bitcoin has grown a lot in the past year. In fact, over, over $50 million a day is transacted on the Bitcoin network. Upwards of 50,000 merchants accept it as a method of payment, and inspirational people like Bill Gates and Al Gore and Ben Bernanke have all praised its merits and its potential. But Bitcoin can seem quite complicating and daunting at first. And the reality is, if you, really able, if you really want to be able to understand how it works and to appreciate Bitcoin on a technical level, you need a PhD in mathematics or cryptography, and that would take a lot of time. But the reality is, we use a lot of technology every day that we don't fully understand how it works. Our smartphones, our computers, the internet. And the fact is, Bitcoin is the same way. There's a bigger picture here that goes beyond its price or its inner workings. Bitcoin is the idea that we can take back power and control of our money and that we can transact in a better way. Now, simply put, Bitcoin is two things. It's a digital currency and an international payment network where this digital currency can be transferred. And I know what you're thinking. We already have currencies and we already have payment networks. So what's the big deal? Well, in fact, we also already have digital currencies. If you consider the fact that only 11% of all US dollars exist in physical printed form, and the rest are simply digital balances in bank accounts, which is very similar to Bitcoin, actually. So before we look at why Bitcoin is different from what we have and what its benefits are, it's important to understand the current systems that we use today. Currencies are managed by central banks and governments. We trust that these entities will protect the value of our currencies, and that's why the $20 bill you have in your pocket isn't really worth $20. The plastic that it's printed on isn't worth much at all. But we trust the government that backs it. And we trust them and give them the power to manage this currency and fight against inflation by, well, giving them the ability to print as much as they want. And we hope that they won't print too much. As for payment networks, we rely on centralized institutions like banks and other financial companies like credit card, company, credit card processors. We trust them with our personal data and we trust that they'll initiate our transactions and process them on time. And I've used the word trust a lot and the fact is we give them a lot of trust, blind trust, and we give these central entities a lot of power as well. And the fact is times are changing today. While we're giving all these entities blind trust, the reality is only 14% of people, in the United States at least, really, truly have great trust in their governments. And even less people have great trust in financial institutions. But again, they're controlling our money.
They're printing it. They're transacting it. This is a problem. Around the world, governments have breached this trust. In fact, in some countries, they've been hit with hyperinflation. Upwards of 12,000% per year in Argentina and millions of percentage points. It's, it's unfathomable. But imagine waking up one morning and a loaf of bread goes from costing $3 to $100 billion. This is the reality in places like Zimbabwe, where their currency is so volatile, only because the governments are poorly managing their money, money supply and printing money as they please. But it's not only governments that have breached our trust, it's also banks that have breached our trust as well. We think back to the 2008 financial crisis, where banks who we trusted to secure and safeguard our money took very risky chances with it and actually lost a lot of money. And people lost their retirement savings. People lost their homes. And a lot of these banks weren't held accountable. Instead, they were given more money by the government. They were bailed out. But worse, it's not just the banks. Even our credit card companies let us down time and time again. It seems like every week there's a news story about tens of millions of people's personal information that's just been stolen and used for fraudulent purposes. So while in theory, having a currency managed by a central entity like a bank or government and having payment networks that are overseen by all of these financial institutions, well, in reality, they're taking advantage of the power that they have and we're the ones that have to pay the price. But when we think about money, money is very important. It's almost all we think about. That's why we go to school, most of us. That's why we go to work. We need to pay for things. But we have very little control over our money, as we can see, the way it's created, the way that it's transacted. Now, people have tried for years, many years, decades even, to find a way to create a currency and a payment network that can exist outside of these typical control structures. A currency and a payment network, or I guess just money, that we can control ourselves. We don't have to rely on any single entity to create or to help us transact. And technology always provides many solutions. So many computer scientists have spent um, almost over 40 years, actually, trying to create this. And they've all failed. In fact, there's never been a financial system or digital currency that's existed in a decentralized way. And the reason for this is simple. The reason we trust governments and we give them the power to create our money is because, well, if, if they didn't do it, who would? Where would this money come from? If we didn't have financial institutions to process all of our payments and banks to store our funds, well, who would do it? We need to trust these people to verify things and to create money. Well, the only reason that we haven't been able to create a system like this is because of a problem that's been dubbed by many computer scientists as the double spend problem. Now, digital things are great, but the problem with things that are digital is that they can be easily copied. So if we create a digital currency or a digital payment network, well, how do we stop people from being dishonest and copying their money or just creating more money out of thin air? And this is a problem that well, has been unsolved for many, many years until recently. And one man had an idea. He found a technical solution to this problem where we can prevent people from creating money out of thin air digitally and spending money twice. And this man, or an anonymous developer in fact, because we're not really sure who he is, was named Satoshi Nakamoto. And in 2008, he put forth to the community online this technical white paper, about eight pages, where he said, hey, I solved the problem. We can have a digital currency and a digital payment network that doesn't rely on central banks or financial institutions. It's entirely self-sufficient. And he promoted this, he sh showed it to everyone online, and then he disappeared, and he left it in the hands of the community. And since then, six years later, thousands and thousands of developers, cryptographers, entrepreneurs, They've all come together to create Bitcoin payment network and community. And today, this eight-page paper has transformed into a payment network and digital currency worth over $6 billion that's used around the world. And how he did this is the coolest part. Now, traditional structures that we have today are centralized. 
that means all of our uh, money is stored in a central location. And we tell the banks, hey, we need you to record all of the transactions that we perform in one central spot, and we'll pay you fees to do it, and we're going to trust that you're going to make sure that all the records are accurate and you'll process all the transactions. What Satoshi Nakamoto said is, no, this is not good. We need a better way. Wouldn't it be nice if we can all do this together? And everyone that uses the payment network can all record transactions at the same time. Having a decentralized network has many benefits, not just the fact that we don't need to trust centralized institutions, but there's actually much more to it than that. With a decentralized network, we can prevent people from spending money twice because you can't fool an entire network of users and computers who are validating all of these transactions. But it's more than that, because now anyone who contributes computing power and resources to support this network, this peer-to-peer -peer network that's open to anybody who wants to contribute, well, that means that we have a fixed supply of money. You can't print bitcoins if you need more. They're generated every 10 minutes at a fixed and predetermined rate. We fight inflation by design using the laws of mathematics and not politics. But it's also more than that. Bitcoin also gives us an international payment network that's fast and cheap. Bitcoin does what payment processing companies charge billions of dollars a year to do, but it does it more efficiently and cheaper. In fact, all the Bitcoin network needs to operate is the internet and people that want to use it. It can exist entirely outside of the infrastructures of law and finance, which is important in areas that have political instability. Recently, in Ukraine, well, there's been a lot of political instability, and what people have done is they've turned to Bitcoin, and they said, hey, we can raise money from around the world very easily, very quickly, without any restrictions, because you can't, with Bitcoin, transactions can't be blocked. You can send money to anyone, anywhere in the world, and it's really easy, in fact. In fact, I'm going to go and send her 50 cents right now. And it's done. I just sent 50 cents to Ukraine, and I paid 5 cents in fees. It was near instant. You can't send a PayPal transaction to Ukraine. You can't send money there very easily at all. But we just did. Now, what can Bitcoin do to help us today? How can it change the way that things work in, in a really practical sense? Let's look at identity theft. This is a problem that's very large around the world. Annually, $21 billion are lost by businesses, and one in 10 people will be affected. The most common way of getting your identity stolen is by having your credit card information stolen from a database or your banking information. Now, how many of you have downloaded a digital product in the last year, an app, a song, a movie? You all had to pay with a credit card, but you didn't receive anything physical. There's no reason for you to provide your name, your address, you're just downloading something. But the way that credit cards were designed to work way back in the 1950s, way before the internet was invented, was this way. So we're stuck using it and putting our information at risk. With Bitcoin, well, you don't need information like, like your address to buy digital products. You can just click and purchase them, which makes life a lot easier but safer. And it's the same thing for bank transactions. If you want to send a wire transfer, this is all the information that you need. It's very invasive for yourself, but also for the person you're sending money to. With Bitcoin, this is all that you need to send a transaction. So again, it's secure by design. It's safe because it doesn't require you to trust your information. It doesn't take it in the first place. Another great thing about the technology, as we just saw when I sent 50 cents to Ukraine, is that, well, the network doesn't care how much money you're sending or where you're sending it to. It doesn't charge you more for doing that. So. If you want to read an article on the internet, why subscribe for a three-month subscription? Why not just pay a couple of cents to read the article? Well, credit card fees would be very extreme and it wouldn't make it worth it, but with Bitcoin, you can. And the Chicago Sun-Times has actually started accepting Bitcoin payments for articles. But what's cooler with microtransactions such as this are the other implications that it can have. Think about going on Facebook. You like a post. 
someone posted something and you think it's cool. A like is pretty useless. I mean, it's gratifying, but it doesn't give you anything tangible. Imagine you can tip someone on the internet a few cents. Hey, that was funny. I like that picture. I'm going to give you 25 cents. It's possible with Bitcoin, and it's very easy. You just click a button. So microtransactions are great. But this is all really first world problems. It's cool, but what else, what else can it do? What else can it help us achieve? International remittances and payments are the lifeblood for many people in many countries. But unlike the Bitcoin network, payment processors do care where you send money to and how much you send, and they discriminate with that. And it actually costs more to send money to a poor country. The average in sub-Saharan Africa is 12%. The highest extent, it could go up to 25%. Africa itself, as a continent, on an annual basis, loses $1.8 billion in excess fees. Imagine if people sending money to Africa didn't have to pay such extreme fees, what this extra money could do to help local economies and help people in their everyday lives. Goldman Sachs has estimated that if Bitcoin is used for all types of international transactions, not just to Africa, but around the world, it could introduce savings and fees of almost or even over $100 billion just in fees that are saved by using a more efficient network than what we have today. Now, this financial network that Bitcoin, can cre well, Bitcoin has created is very useful and very fast and very cheap, but it's also very inclusive. And there's a big problem in the world today. We're looking at high fees and we feel like we're getting ripped off, but there's some people who would be happy to get ripped off by payment processing companies and banks just to have access to a financial system. Because the reality is, there's a lot of people that don't have any access to any financial systems whatsoever. A lot. Well, there is some good news in this circumstance. They may not have access to a financial institution, but they do have access to telephones. And with Bitcoin, they can have a bank in their pocket by connecting to an international payment network that's free to use, cheap to send money with, and easy to access. There's a lot of projects going on right now to help bring this payment functionality to cell phones in Africa and around the world, and they're making great progress. So to conclude, I have to ask, why does Bitcoin matter? And simply put, it matters because it allows us to transact freely. We can send money to whoever we want, wherever they are, with no restrictions. It cannot be blocked. We can transact safely because the network requires a minimal amount of information. It's efficient, but more than anything, we, we can take back power and control of our money and reduce the amount of trust that we need to put into central points of failure. And this is profound because, like I said, money is important. And we want to make sure that we can keep, keep control of it and that we really ultimately have the power to do what we want with our money. And it can't be taken away from us when we can't have transactions blocked. Thank you.